Hi, I'm Irish Paralympian and Sky Sports Scholar Ellen Keane and I'm back in the studio today to talk to two people who've had a major impact on my sporting career, both in and outside the pill. Um, the first guest I have on today is an old teammate of mine. Um, we've travelled the world together competing and he's had a colourful career himself. He, we've competed at multiple world and European championships. He's a two-time Paralympian. He has one World Championship bronze medal from 2013 and two European bronze medals from 2014. I was absolutely heartbroken in 2019 when he decided to retire, but I'm delighted to have him on the show today. James, welcome. Thanks, Alan. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Is it weird being a retired athlete and being invited back onto a sports show? Yeah, no, I, it, it is slightly odd, but I think like that's the whole thing about being like a former elite athlete. You're still involved in in the kind of the community. You're still interested in the sport, um, so it's 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 nice to be involved again and and, and be on the show. Once a Paralympian, all, always a Paralympian, James. Exactly. So I like to, whenever I have a Paralympian on, I like to talk about their disability and what classification they would have been in their sport. So I know that you are an S five. Um, but a lot of people wouldn't understand what that is or uh, the other sort of disabilities that you compete against. So can you just give us a brief idea of what that looked like for you? Yeah, yeah. So I'll, I'll probably give a, a background to my own disability to start with. So basically I was um, born with a condition. Now, it's not a specific condition. It's a general grouping called uh, Focamelia. So it's congenital phacomelia, which Im implies it's, well, it's, it is from birth. So what it involves is basically a number of limb deficiencies uh, across a number of different limbs. So in my case, all four limbs are affected to varying degrees. Uh, both my legs are quite substantially short, about half the size of what they normally would be. And I'm missing a number of bones in my arms. And then on my left arm, I'm just missing my pinky finger, which makes pinky promises uh, <laughs> not possible. Um, but uh, but on a serious note, no. Um, so my classification is, uh, as you said, Alan, is S5. So that's basically in Paralympic swimming, the classifications for physical impairment range from one to 10. Uh, so the S is just swimming and the number after is obviously the number. Then 11 to 13 is varying forms of visual impairment and S14 is, is generally a mild intellectual or learning difficulty. Uh, so S5 is kind of, it's it's somewhat middle in, in, in the road in terms of impairment. So S10 would be your least impaired athletes. Ones would be your most severely impaired athletes. So S5 is probably, while it's kind of in the middle, it's it's, it's more so towards the more severe. So uh, people I'd be competing against would have quite substantial disabilities. They'd be, in often cases, missing uh, in multiple entire limbs. They might be paralyzed below the waist. Uh, my category is very colorful. There's a whole range of disabilities so that very few athletes look the same. There'd be, like I'd say, there's one other athlete I know, there's a Danish athlete that I used to compete against and our conditions were very, very similar, but otherwise I've never come across a competitor that has even a disability similar, even anything likewise. Um, so yeah. Thank you. So why did James Scully choose swimming as his sport? Yeah, I think uh, my uh, route into sport is kind of a, uh, less formal and less uh, organized per se. So I would have tried a, a number of sports as a, as a young kid. My parents were always very, very keen on getting me involved in physical, uh, physical, physical activity because the nature of my disability makes it hard to get exercise other ways because I can't walk long distances. And even in a wheelchair, because I have an arm deficiency, that makes it hard to push myself in the wheelchair as well. So they were always keen to get me involved in different types of sports and try them out. So it, it would have ranged from wheelchair athletics. Uh, the most memorable before swimming is probably uh, I gave uh, had a go at wheelchair basketball as a young kid. But unfortunately, at the time, uh, I used to jump out of the wheelchair with the ball, <laughs> go down the course with it. So that was kind of uh, frowned upon, let's just say. Um, so that I knew that wasn't for me quite quickly. But uh, no, it was it was by chance through the uh, the Irish Wheelchair Association initially that I um, they basically suggested they said there's a an Irish Wheelchair Gala in Navan, so I'm based in Ratote, so Navan's only a stone's throw relatively from me in Mead, and uh, so I went along not expecting much. I was never particularly a strong swimmer, but I did swimming lessons as a kid, so I went off to that gala and didn't do particularly well, uh, and then after that we kind of my parents made a few more inquiries. They got in touch with Dave Malone in the National Aquatic Centre. And from there, it was kind of a like a slow building process. Like initially, I started off very, very junior athlete and built my way up to the to the top level. 
So were you swimming in a, a club with able-bodied athletes as well? How did they how did they interact with you as well? Yeah, no, uh, when I when I was swimming, basically when I joined the NAC, uh, Dave actually, a four-time Paralympian himself, uh, was on the kind of cusp of retiring himself. But he also had Paul Byrne, another uh, uh, disabled swimmer as well. And so there was people in the club now, you're talking between me and Paul and Dave, if when Dave was swimming, you're maybe 1%, 2% of the club, which which isn't unexpected. But uh, so I always would have trained growing up and had my my career with able-bodied athletes uh, normally. But like, look, obviously, when you're training as a kid, someone with a disability, it's unusual. It's it's unique. It takes a bit of time to adapt to. So like I'm sure in, in the junior squad, and the development squad, there was other people like eight, nine-year-olds, and they're not going to understand the nature of disability. So they probably would have had questions. They would have been maybe a bit nervous around me. I probably would have been nervous as well. But as we kind of grew up, I ended up, like I spent, what, maybe 10, 12 years training in the aquatic centre in total. And a couple of those people that I trained with from the very beginning were training with me at, at the end. when I finished <laughs> Some, the of end. <laughs> Some of them are still there. Some of them are still there. And... What sort of adaptions would you make in training? Because obviously when you're in a club environment, you're still, you're competing with other, you're training with other swimmers, but there's limited lane space. So obviously because of the nature of your disability, you'd be a lot slower and you would be, your, your sets might be a lot less just to be able to get some train, the same amount of training kind of done in the same amount of time. What adaptions would you make in the pool to be able to kind of just yeah. more more efficient kind of? Yeah, there, there would have been a number of it. And I think that's the that's and that reinforces the whole thing, particularly with more impaired swimmers, that it's very important for the coach to be able to get the training right and have it specifically designed. So like if you're, let's say, an S10, for example, most S10 high performance athletes can keep up with uh, or even outperform their able-bodied athletes at a club level in, in many cases. Um, so there isn't a huge amount of adaption in that regard. But in my case, uh, it, it, it's very important to have that specifically designed uh, training program. So it, it basically would have involved, it would have been the same science, the same kind of uh, basis for training. However, it would have been tailored to myself. So I would have done, let's say, less laps. I would have done, on, done them on a slower time. There might have been more rest intervals. There might have been less rest intervals, depending where I was at at the training. Uh, so I was, kind of, I was quite lucky in, in regard to have Dave as a coach yeah. uh, in terms of he'd been there, he'd He'd lived the experience. He'd won the medal. So he knew, whilst he might not have known about S5s, because uh, we're quite a unique uh, category, he knew the nature of uh, Paralympic swimming. So he, he was open to the idea of uh, exploring how training loads would impact on me. But look, for disabled swimmers, it's, 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 a, it's an ongoing process. Like me and Dave would have learned over a 10-year period. And we still mightn't have got it right even at the end of my career, there was still learning and stuff like that, uh, both for him and both for, for myself as well. So uh, like even in the gym, it'd be stuff like you'd be trying to do the same t style of training. To uh, however, if you need adaptions, like I would have had um, different things, like maybe ropes or handles that I would have wrapped around, uh, let's say the lat pull, pull down machine uh, that would allow me to do it despite being a lot shorter than the average person would use that machine. But yeah, you find a way and it's, it's about proper engagement. You actually um, completely influenced uh, an adaption that I've made in the gym. So originally when I was in, when I'm in the gym, I had a gym prosthetic and I kept, mm. I kept noticing that the, the heavier I was going, it was breaking a lot or just in certain angles, I wasn't able to, to move my arm a certain way. So one, one of the things that you used in the gym was an airplane seatbelt. <laughs> And I yeah. I took that from you and I use it in the gym all the time now. It's one of the best <laughs> kind of, you need to trademark that, bring out your own airplane seatbelts for gyms. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Um, like, I, I think in, in your approach, and you were always the more scientific of the two of us. <laughs> uh, you were using all these prosthetics and, and high range stuff. I was using an airplane seatbelt. Um, but look, it worked. It was durable. It does. Job. It does. Um, I think that's the most important thing as a person with a disability that you always have to kind of think outside the box. And because you had Dave, you had a coach who was constantly thinking outside the box as well. And so, same with Kieran uh, Kyo, the SNC coach, was always thinking outside the box. Um, I just want to talk about some of your 
favourite moments. So what is your most memorable sporting moment? You've had quite a colourful career, as I said. So what kind of stands out as the highlight for you? Yeah, it's it, it's it's an interesting one, and and even looking back in my career, and I've probably done nearly more reflection as as a non-athlete than when I was was competing, um, because like so people, and that's the thing that's that's quite important for people outside of the sport to understand when they're looking into it is is that the the highlights of a person's career in terms of achievements aren't always the best moments. So, for example, when I won my world championships medal and my European medal the following year, or two European medals the following year, uh they were some of the lowest points of my career in, in, in terms of how I was progressing as an athlete. So like while I was up on the world stage, I was winning medals, I was getting the recognition. My performances were just marginally below my all time bests from the previous Paralympics in London. So I think like, I suppose my, my most memorable moment would probably be London and like not to pick out a specific time. It was just the whole experience of London. Uh, like people say to me, it's like, Oh, look, um, I'm just, like Brazil. It must've been amazing. It must've been fantastic. Yes. Brazil was brilliant. But, and I performed better in Brazil and uh, I was the fittest and the best I could be at Brazil. In London, I was more of a junior athlete. Um, but London was special to me. It was close to home. Uh, my family were over and stuff like that, which they couldn't travel to Rio. Um, and then there was the great story about, um, so Gangnam Style, the song came out pretty much as we were over in the Paralympics. And uh, it obviously became the huge sensation that it is. And uh, the, one of the assistant coaches, Hayley Burke, said to uh, dared me after my 100 freestyle final. So it was the last event uh, of my Paralympics in London. I think it was one of the last events of the swimming in Paralympics. I think it was, yeah, because you were fuming that you were the last one competing. <laughs> I, was the, I, was one of the, I was on day one and day 10 and day five. So there was no, uh, there was no kind of quiet time. But uh, but after she dared me after the final to get out and do Gangnam style for a bit, and I I was like, ah, oh, no, I won't do. It. But I actually got out of the field and did it. And like, <laughs> eighteen people in a swimming stadium. It was it was just a nice moment. It'll be one I'll remember. But look, not to say that there isn't a whole pile of other uh, memories. But that's probably the most standout one. And obviously, we're teammates and. Teamwork makes the dream work. So what is, I know what you're going to say here, but what is your most memorable uh, kind of teammate moment throughout your career? Um, well, I, I, I suppose, I suppose there's quite a few and I'm probably not thinking of the one you're thinking of, okay. but like in, in, in terms, no, just off the top of my head, but in terms of like the team, I think the whole build up into Rio, the four years that like, myself, yourself, Nicole and Alba all trained together. That was special. And I, I think the four of us being able to train together on a daily basis, then go over to like the likes of Uberlandia for the the preparation camp and then to the games ultimately. And, and also having yourself as well as a senior athlete. That was really helpful to me, having someone to bounce off and kind of as a sounding board because like you, you don't mm -hmm. appreciate until you look back on it how important having someone who's also been there and done that to kind of uh, tease out things, talk about training, talk about experiences. Because um, like one of the quotes that I, I ultimately learned from Dave going into London was I asked him, I was like, oh, look, what's a Paralympics like? And he says, Scully, look, there's just you just can't prepare for a Paralympics. You can do your best. You can be the best that you can be on the day. But in terms of emotions, in terms of just the event, there's no way to prepare for it, just to be as relaxed and prepared as you can be. But you, And that's, I suppose, you, you'd probably feel the same way, Alan. But, and that's why... I think the four-year cycle, yeah, there was loads of lows, a good few highs. <laughs> to be honest, probably more lows than highs, and that's just the nature of the course, I think, in general. But uh, I think it was that, that was probably the most special kind of... I know it's probably not answering the question. It's probably given four years as a no. special moment. But I think that, to me, that's the... But the I'm sure you've there's anecdotes and funny stories. Along the the anecdote, the funny story that I'm thinking of um, is, as a swimmer, uh, there are certain things that you do to prepare for a competition and one of the things that swimmers do, particularly males, is that they have to shave down. So Rio was going to be, we all knew that Rio was your last Paralympic Games. We mm. knew that you were in such good shape and you were going out there. It wasn't about getting a medal for you, it was about doing your best swim of your mm. life and showing yourself and your friends and your family and your teammates what you're capable of. So we had to tick all the boxes. So we had to get you as silky smooth as possible. We were shaving <laughs> you down and getting you as silky smooth as possible. So uh, do you want to share from your perspective that memory? 
yeah um yeah so so basically as you said it, it's about preparing as much as you can and yes a part of the being a male swimmer you do have to shave down your entire body except for basically your speedo line which is a tiny percentage so most guys aren't <laughs> process, and frankly most guys aren't good at that process either uh and to be honest most male swimmers also happen to be of kind of let's say the the low hair variety uh i'm the polar opposite uh, i'm head <laughs> You're to a bear toe, but, uh, <laughs> Chewbacca, uh, a small Chewbacca, but still Chewbacca nonetheless. So there's, and, and obviously due to the nature of my disability, I can't reach lots of power in my body. So <laughs> yeah, in the in the night before my 200 freestyle uh, heats, it involved uh, yourself and Haley uh, with big razors shaving me head to toe in the in the bathroom in the apartment in Rio. And uh, the unlike London, the kind of the the athlete's accommodation in Rio was a bit. Uh, Smaller. A bit quirky. So <laughs> what ended up happening was that the the shower got blocked with so much hair, and it w- it was just a grim. And that wasn't just me. There was a couple of other people sharing the bathroom. We were also shaving down. Scully, so it wasn't. Of- it wasn't even just big razors. It was two bottles of Veet and about two packets of razors. Like it was exactly. Yeah. Oh you're no, a like small I man. Like razors at a time. Uh, oh yeah, it was Veet. I I, I Veeted head to toe. You then didn't Veet. I, had I Veeted you. Go- <laughs> But I had to do myself what I could reach beforehand. That's how much of a big deal it was, was that it took like two rounds of beach. It took an electric shaver head to toe. It took a whole packet of big razors. And and then I was the silkiest man on that day, I'd say in the whole world. There was no one silky. <laughs> you, were literally, you were literally a fish. You were so Sorry, I missed that. You were literally a fish. I was literally a fish. And <laughs> I went out the next day and performed the best best uh, performance of my life. So it was worth it. So it all worked. It was so worth that's, it. Uh, that's it, the, yeah. that comes down to team effort. <laughs> um, so as well as having those mad kind of stories to tell, we've had a few mad encounters with people and their perception of disabilities and the sort of questions that we've been asked over the years. Um, there was one the one story in particular I'm thinking of when because what we would do after training we would do our session and then we might go to the jacuzzi for a little bit just a little post-swim recovery and we'd have like members coming in but we also have some random people coming in and talking to us can you remember the the story I'm thinking of yeah uh yeah I remember well and and I suppose it it it, it like being a person with a disability, and especially within myself, that it's it's a very obvious thing. It's not something I can hide. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I suppose, like growing up in life, I'd be used to like little kids, children pointing, laughing, mainly through lack of understanding. They've never seen a person with disability before, so I'm well used to that. Yeah, uh, you can understand uh, kids. Bit... Exactly. Yeah, but this incident was a bit uh, peculiar. So basically, yeah. yeah. Just relax. Oh, can you hear me? I know we're just. I think, yeah. Okay, I think we just had a bit of a disconnection. I think it might be your Wi-Fi. But can you just repeat that? The whole story. Of so yeah, you being in the jacuzzi. Yes. Yeah, so. so <laughs> so basically, we were in the jacuzzi, uh, relaxing after the set, and a man got in, and I have this kind of sixth sense uh, where I can predict, to a certain degree, when people are going to say something bizarre or something disability-related, and it's going to be probably insensitive, um, but I'm well used to it. So I kind of got that look off your man, and I was like, oh, inside, I was like, he's going to say something. And then he looks at me, he looks at you, he looks back at me, he goes, what's wrong with you? And I was just like, oh, dear. And so basically the two of us ended up explaining our disabilities. Uh, and he was like, grand, yeah. And then he moved on to it and he kind of was thinking to himself for a while. And then he came back and he was like, like, that's a big inspiration. Like, you just must find life really hard. And we were like, no, no, not really. Like, look, we make do. It's a challenge. And we explained our lives and that, that kind of stuff and how we're competing at the highest level and that kind of trying to move away from the negative. And then... <laughs> He kind of took all we had to say on board and then he sat there and kind of thought to himself and he's kind of, hmm. And then he looks at me specifically and he goes, I suppose you're right. Like, otherwise, like, it's better than just being dead, isn't it? (laughs) 
and it was kind of like it took me aback. Like I'm never usually taken aback, and it was kind of like, yeah, you might as well get on with it. Otherwise, you might as well wish you were dead, kind of a thing. And it was like, now he didn't mean it in but a negative or hostile sense. He was literally just telling it just me came like, out. It be and yeah, it, it was just strange. But look, over the years, I've had my fair share, and I'm sure you're the same, Ellen, of people who just say bizarre things, not necessarily meaning it in a mean way, but just saying it and not realizing. Not realizing, yeah. It could potentially be. Uh, but yeah, that, yeah, that was the story. So yeah, and it was it was strange. They sometimes, um, and as polite as we can be, um, they just sometimes don't realize that it is. A human being that's just like them and they just don't even realize what's coming out of their mouth sometimes i remember once exactly. we went because we'd hang out a lot as well and i remember once uh we went out to kildare village and we went out for our food and the waiter like gave me the the bill and was like oh aren't you great <laughs> It was like I was bringing you out for a day for because he didn't realise that I was a disabled too and I was just your carer bringing you out for the day. Yeah, and, and, I, and I think there's that element that's... Like, look, it, 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 it's people being nice, it's people being genuine. Uh, it's, it's probably people making assumptions because yeah. there's a whole range of people with disabilities, people who do have carers who need that service, people who don't necessarily, and then everyone in between. So I suppose it's kind of... And, and I can understand from people who don't have a disability, they're looking in and going, oh, and it is awkward to, for a lot of people to, to broach the subject. They probably just made the assumption that because you're either not disabled or less disabled, that you're naturally the carer, um, which I think Irish Sometimes attitudes Sometimes I are, was, but that wasn't because you were disabled. <laughs> No, possibly not, but it, it, it's hard to know as well. I, I suppose there's that element that when you're with a when a disabled person's with an able-bodied person, you have those assumptions, and then when a, a a moderately disabled person is with a mildly disabled person, you also have that. So uh, <laughs> it works in both senses. Let's just go back to sport for a little bit. Um, why did you retire? What made you decide? Okay, now is my time. Yeah, I think it was it was probably a feeling I'd had for quite a while, uh, especially particularly after London. So after London, I was kind of now I never thought I wasn't at the peak of my game, obviously, in London and future results proved that. But it was kind of a point that I'd I'd achieved basically in, in my category, the way it's designed and my category kind of comes down to peculiar different influences. But I knew for a number of years I was never no matter how well I did and how hard I trained, I wasn't ever going to win a medal. So it always moved instead towards achieving as much as I can achieve and being the best I can be, which to be honest, that's what all athletes should do regardless. Um, so I think when I got to London, I, I had my lifetime best. Um, after, in, the, in the period after, it was kind of a possibly a bit of a demotivating um, factor in that knowing that, okay, like I can go to Rio and and this is probably putting a negative spin on it, but I could go to Rio, achieve my best again, probably do better, but I still wouldn't have anything to take home from it. Um, and that was probably an immature place I was at at the time. I was only maybe, what, 19. I was still junior in terms of like my maturity. Uh, but then building into the Rio cycle, the Rio cycle was lots of ups. For me, it was, a, it was, it was two time, two, double the amount of downs as it was ups just from various different reasons, a lot of changes in my life, a lot of changes in, in my career. I changed swimming clubs, I went back. Um, and then by Rio, like in the build-up to Rio, uh, I found it quite challenging from a kind of a motivational perspective to get myself back in the game. So what motivated me was, look, get to Rio, get everything done, do everything right, and you get to Rio, you do your best, and that's it. And uh, so to be honest, I'd earmarked, Po like the, the the Rio Olympics 2016 as my retirement date, uh, and then to take and then to kind of, if needed, maybe take a bit of a reflection period. But I didn't intend on going back after Rio. But it was kind of like I took a good long period after discussing with the people in Port. Oh, I think the connection might be going again. No. Oh no. Um, after talking to kind of to the people important to me and uh, my family, my coach, fellow competitors, my teammates. I kind of re kind of re, like re uh, imagined where I was going. Um, and then obviously there was the, the, the impact of the 
European Championships being announced in Dublin in my own pool, the one I'd swam in for 10 years. So that was kind of the moment where I was like, okay, I'll take a good break from swimming in 2017. I'll keep, keep involved in the program. I'll do probably half of what I was doing. To be honest, I wasn't as committed. On the other side, I had gotten a full-time job. I was working in Bank of Ireland at the time. Um, so my kind of main objective was to be to continue swimming, develop my career so that I'd be able to transition really well from sport into my professional life. So that was kind of going in the background. And look, again, that was challenging, balancing a full-time job, which even if you're only uh, a part-time high-performance swimmer, like the hours involved in it is huge. Yeah. And driving, like if you're working a nine-to-five job, you're finishing at five, and then you have the prospect of driving from the city centre out into empty 50 traffic to go out to Blanche to train for an hour, an hour and a half, and then go home. Like that took its toll on me as well. So like Dublin was never going, that was going to be it. Uh, and then for, for now, my kind of focus is on, the non-athlete lifestyle. Now, look, I still love swimming. I'm st- I'm intending on getting back involved. I know uh, uh, one of the other teammates, Alva, who recently retired as well. She's putting the pressure on. You're putting the pressure on Ellen to get me back in the pool, get me training and stuff, uh, which is good. And I and I and I, I I wanted to do that, but it was kind of a period after after the 2018 championships. I didn't want to see a pool for a year or so. And that's uh, fair. And I did that. And then just as I kind of said, okay, I'll start getting back in. Coronavirus happened. So, <laughs> oh, that so coronavirus. Now, <laughs> Thought we yeah, wouldn't no, talk about that in this interview. <laughs> <laughs> Thought we'd get away from it. Yeah, exactly. Absolutely. No, but like that, that's kind of like my career kind of spanned across the time, but I'd always had kind of a plan B. Yeah. Um, which I think and is important yeah. for other athletes. That's a really important thing to have. And I think if anyone listening to this is ta- thinking of, retiring post Tokyo or even retiring in the next few months I think it's a really important lesson that they can learn from you is that uh, just have that plan b and to kind of go out in your own terms and make sure that you don't have any regrets where it doesn't sound like you do Scully we're gonna have to no. leave it at that but I'm very okay. grateful for you coming on thank you so much it was so great to be able to talk to you Welcome back to the show my name is Ellen Keane and this is the one hour a week where I get to talk to different sporting people in the world of sport and uh, we just had James Scully on there a former teammate of mine and Paralympic swimmer my next guest is another Paralympic legend Dave Malone is a double leg amputee and he began his swimming career in 1994 at a world championships in Malta where he won his first major international medal since then he won a medal at every major international competition that he went to which includes the 1996 Paralympic Games in Atlanta, where he won a silver medal in the S900 meter backstroke. In 2000 in Sydney, he won a joint gold medal in the 100 meter backstroke. In 2004, he won a silver medal in the 100 meter backstroke and then retired at the 2008 Paralympic Games in Beijing, which happened to be my first Paralympic Games. Dave, welcome to my one hour. Yeah, thanks for having me, Ellen. How weird is it listening back to kind of all your sporting achievements? Yeah, it's a uh, it's strange. It's like a different lifetime ago. It's uh, it's uh, when you're reading it out there, it's like it's uh, uh, I suppose a catalogue from somebody else and not myself. Um, how many medals in total do you have? Um, oh God, well I suppose major medals I have eleven in total. Yeah. Um, and that stretched from '94 through to 2004. So uh, and that included, I suppose the the holy grail of medals, the European Championships, the World Championships, and then ultimately for for us as the Paralympic Games. And in 2008, you were going to Sydney to win that gold medal. How did it feel to win it with someone else and to have to share that podium with someone else? Um, It's strange, actually, because it's it's one a relief because it was probably my worst performance over the four-year cycle, despite being my best prepared. So on the day, um, I didn't race particularly well. So to actually get the gold medal was a major relief. And then uh, I didn't mind actually sharing it. It's very odd. It's a nice story to tell now. Uh, it's, it's very unique. It's, it doesn't happen very often that, that uh, two competitors tie at a major championships like that and specifically for the gold medal. So I think it's, uh, it just adds a little bit of uh, nostalgia to the event, I think, looking back now. It's another little interesting kind of thing to add to your collection of stories, isn't it? 
Um, so I mentioned that 2008 was your last Paralympic Games and that was my first Paralympic Games. So that was the first time that, the first and only time that we were ever teammates at a major international. And since then, you went to work for Paralympics Ireland, you were a manager, you were a coach. And then in 2013, I moved to your club, the NAC, where you became my full-time coach. And we just had James Scully on earlier and he was talking about how you were his coach as well. So how, how important was it for you to stay in the world of para swimming and swimming in general and become a coach? I, I'm not sure. Um, this is a great question. Um, I, I, was, I started my coaching while I was an athlete as well, just because I, I enjoyed it. I, I wanted to have a bit of a, an outlet, I suppose, to my own uh, training. And uh, I enjoyed working with others and helping them to reach their potential. So I, I think I was always going to be staying involved with, with the sport in some capacity. And um, so maybe just through through faith or whatever you want to look at it, I uh, was just fortunate enough to, be, to have the opportunity to to get a role that uh, directly impacting the, the future generation of swimming. So um, I, I find myself very fortunate to have the job um, that I can impact and support athletes. So I think it was just a, a matter of, of the everything aligning and I uh, really haven't looked back. Yeah, I think me and James were talking about how um, important it is to have a coach that's able to adapt as a para as para athletes and because you understand the world of para swimming and the need for adoption in an able body club as well um it's just such an important thing to have so did you know when you were going into coaching because you the nac swim club is a uh, able body club did you know that you were going to have athletes with disabilities did you want to bring athletes in with disabilities because out of everyone in ireland you probably are the only swim coach who probably knows absolutely <laughs> as much as there is to know because you've experienced it yourself um yeah i think i think look the way the way i see it is that um as a coach we're in the uh, particularly as a high performance coach we're in a, a people performance business so for me um it's just sometimes looking outside the box uh, from a in terms of conventional training program so when we have athletes that come in with different impairments and a paralympic athlete i think it's a club environment's ready made to support the development needs of the athletes. And you just have to look, I suppose, at the development ever so slightly. So when you're working with individuals, you're always trying to, to get inside the head of an athlete, what motivates the athlete, you know, um, build a relationship. And then ultimately from a technical point of view, it's, um, you know, it, it's, it's a long process. So I think any club is it's a ready-made environment to support any a Paralympic athlete. So, I think when I got involved, I didn't see any obstacles around it or any barriers. So I think it was just a natural, again, an athlete coming and joining the program and um, engaging with that athlete and seeing how we could help uh, in their journey to support them to whatever that would take, whether it's a part of the games or whether it's just to enjoy the sport. So I think it was just, I suppose, having the experience of, of adapting programs just maybe came second nature to me. And uh but it's still a challenge every time you meet a new athlete. Their development is slightly different. So um, I, don't, I don't think it was a conscious decision, but it was just something that I, I didn't see any obstacles whatsoever to to open the club up to to all um, ages, all abilities that wanted to come in and learn how to, how to progress in a competitive swimming environment. And you were just so good at it that every para-athlete seemed to just come towards you because I joined you in 2013, but you'd, you'd had... Uh, the NAC swim club for a lot longer. You had other athletes with disabilities a lot long, like a long time before I came along as well. So it, it shows. What is your most favorite memory as a coach, both able-bodied and maybe Paralympic? Because you do have you do have great athletes who are competing at club, national, and international level as well. Sure. Um... It, oh, it's a great question. Um, I just have so many memories. Like every every season creates new new memories. Uh, what I enjoy most about it, I suppose, is is, um, is going along that journey. And I think when you really, when an athlete really digs deep and really pulls out a, a tremendous performance, um, is really my most satisfying. So it, it's hard sometimes because when you're working in it, you know, you share the highs, you share the lows, as we're aware. But um, I think it's easier to pick out specific moments um, when athletes finish their careers, you know. So, um, 
you know, for me, it's kind of uh, the, the greatest memories are more around training camps. They're more around the preparation. So when I think back on things I enjoyed most is is uh, it's just sharing the story, you know. So everybody would always say, you know, is it somebody winning a medal? That's your your your, your best memory and generally they're not you know it's something that uh you know happens in the in the call room before it or you know i remember you know the chats at the side of the the, the warm-up pool you know they're the things that i go back to and remember because uh thankfully there's there's so many images and photos that you get back of events you know takes you straight back into that but for me it's always the the little the little nuggets you know prior to a race or you know, seeing the, the face when the when when yourself or, or James <laughs> used to come back after the after the race, and uh, you know, and I just think getting wrapped up in all of those uh, stories, you know, I think it's um, I, I just can't pinpoint exact moments per se. It's just yeah. there's so many, you know, you could pin them out for every single athlete, but uh, but I think they're the most special to me. It's actually kind of looking back at, at specific moments along yeah. those journeys that I always remember, rather than necessarily the medals. Yeah, that's very true. Because I even like medals are just a bit of metal. It's more about the journey that we've been on and the memories that we've made. Um, <laughs> how does it actually feel as a coach, knowing you've done all that you can possibly do and trusting the athlete to go? Like as soon as that athlete goes into the call room, you, there's nothing you can do. <laughs> you've done all that you can do. It's now up. You have to trust that person to just perform. How does that feel? Um. I don't know. You never get used to it. I think it's the next best thing to competing yourself if you've been a high performance athlete in the past. And I think for me, the, the most nerve wracking piece is the moment that the that, you know, the athlete leaves your company and goes to the call room. And, you, you know, it's that it's that 15, 20, 25 minutes. That's for me is the most nerve wracking for me because I get excited about the, the performance and uh look forward to it and uh, you know that's where my nervous energy kind of kicks in it's not so much in the warm-up when everybody's preparing uh i actually feel very relaxed and very uh you know calm and focused in those moments but it's it's that time when you you, you move away from the athlete and uh it's the in, in anticipation i suppose of the event um that that's a strange feeling you know because you're, you're really you're willing everybody to 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 perform every time that they get up onto the blocks and as we know that uh, it, it doesn't always happen. So sometimes you're, you're as a coach, you're second guessing at that stage, uh, even though you've known you've done everything we can to, to prepare to be there, but you're, you're just hoping that all the preparation and, and uh, everything that you've, you've done is going to bear fruit, I suppose, at that time. So um, as a coach, I suppose that's my most nerve wracking time. Um, waiting for the athletes to come out. and then <laughs> It's then not even the competing. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, it's a strange one, you know, but it's, um, it's a fantastic experience because I think uh, as a coach, you know, you can't necessarily impact the performance of the athlete at that stage. Everything's been done. So um, you're really, uh, you know, willing everybody to perform. So um, they're the moments I think that brings coaching alive. You know, that's the magic of the whole thing and why people are involved and yeah. why you look forward to it. Yeah. Yeah. As a coach, obviously we were preparing for a big competition this year, Tokyo and coronavirus kind of obviously changed our plans as a coach how how did you manage uh the pools closing how did you manage trying to keep people motivated to train like how did it affect you overall as well um it's kind of i've, I've liked like everyone else i've had my own ups and downs you know it's, it's it's such a new experience for all of us and we've we've put so much work and time and energy into um into the Tokyo journey since Rio and uh, I suppose uh, so much planning goes into it and, and I think we've you know really get to a stage where uh, we might be out of the water for a week we might be out for 10 days and you know and I think from that point of view really had to adapt and reposition quite quickly because we just had no idea how how long this would affect our I suppose daily training environment and I think one of the easy things was the games once the games got postponed to 2021 it kind of gave us all, um, uh, I, I suppose, uh, an environment and then we could reposition and reset, as I said. Um, and then at that stage, it was <laughs> the challenging thing for me as a coach. I'm a swimming coach. So how do I uh, position, I suppose, the training program when we don't have access to the water? 
And um, so, you know, from from banding around ideas with the physiologists, from talking to colleagues and cycling and, you know, trying to set up, um, uh, I suppose, the training environment at home, as you're aware of, and connecting in with the athletes. And I suppose really sharing how everybody was going through it together. And uh, as, as you know, we, we set up the weekly Zoom calls. We obviously had our own calls in together. Um, and just seeing the team connect and seeing the maturity of the group and how yeah. everybody genuinely came together to, to kind of reset the values of ourselves as a team and how we could support each other. So I think as a coach, that gave me great strength and belief in terms of what we were working together towards and and ultimately to try and utilize this time to, to learn a little bit more um, from talking to other coaches, which I've been very fortunate to be able to jump on some of the world-class coaching uh, webinars and Zooms that have been on. So, um, and then start to work with the team again in terms of, of this return to the pool. I think we were out of the water for 77 days, I think, all in. Um, so I had a real idea built up in my head about what I wanted to do when we came back and see how it, it, it interacted. And a lot of it was just intuition and guesswork. But um, so it gave me a, a goal. It gave me something to focus on. And albeit very, very different, um, I think it, it gave us an opportunity to to take some time out and reset. So I, I think ultimately I, I reset that the game's being postponed really quickly. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, it probably didn't affect me as much as it would have maybe an athlete or somebody that hadn't been there before. Um, and for me, it's just been able to just change the goalpost ever so slightly. And although we still don't know a lot of the journey we have ahead of us and what that might look like. I think it, it gave us a great grounding um, to become a little bit more resilient and have a little bit more in our armour to, to tackle the, the obstacles that we know and the challenges that we're going to have ahead of us. Have um, coaches from all over the world kind of been sharing their experiences and have you guys kind of learned from other coaches as well in other countries what how they've coped and how they've managed? Is that how you've... Have you kind of applied that to our program as well? Yeah, I think I think that's been one of the great things for me. It's been able to access just from your living room all of these um, Zooms. I've probably sat on maybe 50 different uh, Zooms with coaches from all over the world and sharing their experiences of how they've coached um, gold medalists and world record holders, but also how they were all adapting to to their scenarios in, in their own countries with COVID. And a lot of the, a lot of the stories were very similar. Mm-hmm. Um which, which I suppose gave me great confidence in terms of the work that we're trying to do. Um, we're on the right path, but ultimately you always pick up the little nuggets from everybody. So I love reading about, you know, biographies and different coaching aspects of it, but be able to have that much access and so freely um, yeah. has been, I suppose, one of the greatest things for me in the, in the experience of the, of the last number of months. I think that's the most important thing that kind of I learned during lockdown or not being able to access the pool that although you are a swim coach you're still a coach at the end of the day like I was still able to reach out to you I was still able to contact you like just because I wasn't seeing you every day in the pool I was still able to have my coach be there for me while I was training yeah yeah I'd I'd agree and I think you know maybe sometimes the coaches mask it a little bit better you know because we're (laughs) we're, we're trying to be maybe a little bit upbeat in the situation. But for me, that was a kind of another opportunity because, uh, you know, we're so used to our own environment in the pool. So when you take us out of that, um, it certainly created a a challenge for the first number of weeks as we, as we, I suppose, got used to our new uh, surroundings and what we we had to do. But I think uh, that was a great opportunity for us to connect again as a, as a coach and a, as an athlete and, and uh, as the strength in the relationship that yeah. we have, which is, I hope is a positive relationship. I think <laughs> ah, that's fine. But it's, um, <laughs> but it's, uh, but, but yeah, I think it just gives you a bit of, a bit of time to, to, to rethink some of the things you're doing. And I think ultimately um, uh, as demonstrated by the, the 10 weeks that we came back and trained um, before we just taken a break now, I think, I think we've, we've, we've kind of nailed a, a lot of those aspects of it and really sets us up into next season. Yeah, we've got we've got an exciting next season coming up. Dave, I'm going to have to leave it there, but thank you so much for coming on. That was, of course, Dave Malone, my coach. Um, next up, we have Joe Malone. Sorry, next up, we have Joe Malloy, who will be back in the studio after the break.